On this week's NFES Daily Reality Check, we'll look at some of the top news items from across the space, as well as speak with A10 about DDoS attack security for NFV and SDN powered networks. Thanks for joining us on this week's NFE SD and Routed Check. I'm your host, Dan Meyer, editor in chief at RCR Wireless News. On today's show, we have an interview with Renee Pop, who's the product marketing manager at A10, uh, to discuss some video of security for NFE and SDN powered networks. But first, let's take a look at some of the top headlines from across the telecom related NFE, SDN cloud, and software space from the past week. OPNFE this week released its second platform release dubbed Ramaputra, which the Linux Foundation based organization said was its first full experience with a massively parallel simultaneous release process. The platform is said to tap code from various upstream communities, including OpenStack, OpenDaylight, OpenContrail, Onos, and Etsy. OPNFE said the platform includes hardened feature enhancements, such as configuration integration with recent software releases from OpenStack and OpenDaylight, system-level testing and multiple performance testing frameworks and methodologies, infrastructure and testing environment advancements, advancements, and deployment integration enhancements. In support of the new release, OPNFE said it plans to conduct its first plug fest on May 9th at Cable Lab's headquarters in Lusso, Colorado. Also this week, the Open Daylight Project welcomed Hitachi as a silver member and named a new member to its advisory group, bolstering the open source based organization's work in SDN and FE. Open Daylight, which like OPNFE is based out of the Linux Foundation, noted Hitachi's move showed continued strength in the adoption of open source platforms from Japanese companies. The organization cited products, training, and support in Japan from the likes of Brocade, Cisco, Fujitsu, Huawei, NEC, and NTT Data, and more than 10 end user organizations in Japan have deployed Open Daylight in their networks. Open Daylight also added Carlos Maitos to its advisory group, which is tasked with providing technical input to Open Daylight's developer community. Maitos is currently a board member of Open Daylight's Open Networking User Group and Director of Global Network Architecture at Fidelity Investments. The Open Daylight advisory group includes 16 members from a number of telecom organizations, including Telefonica, AT&T, Orange, Telesonora, and China Mobile. Open Daylight recently rolled out its latest open source platform under the Beryllium name. That platform, which targets SDN programmability, is the fourth from the Linux Foundation-based organization, following the previous Hydrogen, Helium, and Lithium launches. I also recommend you check out the RCR Wireless News and RCR TV websites for a ton of news and video interviews from the recent Mobile World Congress event. Well, for our feature interview this week, I spoke with Renee Pop at 8.10, on security risks and challenges facing NFE and SDN powered network deployments. Let's take a look at that interview now. My name is Dan Meyer, Editor-in-Chief at RCR Wireless News, and joining us for the NFE uh, SDN Reality Check Show this week. Uh, today we are joined by Renee Pop, who's the uh, Product Marketing Manager at A10, to talk about uh, security in terms of virtualization, a, a topic I have not covered much myself, but uh, I think from Renee we're going to get some great insights today. So hey, Renee, thanks so much for joining us today. We appreciate it. Thank you, Dan. It's good to be here. Very good. Very good. Well, let me start off with, uh, for those who might not know much about the company, I want to give us a little overview of what you guys do and how you participate, uh, I guess, in the telecom space uh, with, with virtualization and, and things like that. Absolutely. So uh, A10 Networks has been around since 2004. Uh, we make networking equipment, uh, application delivery controllers, or better known as uh, load balancers with extra functions, which makes it the application delivery controllers. So that's really our bread and butter. That's something uh, we've been doing since 06, I think, uh, is when we launched that product. And we've been doing that, um, working in that space very well. Of course, uh, very uh, focused on hardware, but also a move into a network function virtualization is apparent there as well. So the ADC brings you a lot of extra features, uh, including a lot of security features, which we kind of uh, forked off into a separate product line uh, for specifically for DDoS protection. And um, that's something we launched uh, in 2014, January 2014, our Thunder TPS uh, threat protection system, uh, which is a point product just for DDoS protection for a, an entire network. Gotcha. gotcha. Okay. Very good. Very good. Well, now I'll be, okay. I'll see. Sorry. Keep going. Uh, no, that, that was it's in, in a nutshell. Okay. Yeah. Very good. Well, I mean, I know obviously the security issue, uh, you know, in general and, and, you know, in the technology world is a, is a, a, cr a huge issue. Uh, yes. I know for telecom operators it is as well. Uh, I guess what are maybe some of the current security concerns that operators uh, need to be aware of, and what are they? What are they? I guess what are they kind of looking at in terms of 
their overall security picture for their for their networks right now? Well, for telecom providers, they um, suffer from DDoS attacks because they transport transport a lot of this bad traffic uh, going to their subscribers or on the other side where the uh, subscribers are compromised. There, there are so many connected devices these days. Um, uh, smartphones obviously can be compromised and are uh, already enlisted in what's known as botnets. Um, so all these dr mindless drones or zombie <laughs> nodes, as they're called, um, are enlisted in large, large botnets, and they can all be remote controlled by attackers to um, launch a lot of traffic to a victim of their choice and uh, send it off. So for telecom providers, that's a big issue, of course, because it's uh, all this traffic is going over their infrastructure and um, and of course you know compromising uh, quality on that side mm -hmm. yeah very interesting because that's a good point because it does seem like you know you think about uh, the fact that there are all these you know again millions if not billions of devices connecting to networks right. on the mobile side and you're right i mean that's ripe opportunity for you know these, these attacks that we've heard about for years and years mostly on the pc side of things but but yeah as everybody's starting to move more to their smartphones and tablets now uh, yeah, that's, it seemed like a prime, uh, I, I didn't really think about it that much, but you're right, it seems like there's so many, such an opportunity there for, for people who want to, uh, to initiate these, these uh, malicious attacks like that to really uh, take advantage of a network like that. Absolutely, and, uh, and also when you look at, especially mobile providers, right, then um, the cost really there is on the edge of the network, in the radio area network, so uh, all these nodes have to support a lot of Garbage traffic, let's call it. Right? <laughs> and, and so that's that's a uh, immensely inefficient use of their bandwidth, of their very very expensive bandwidth. So um, yeah, so for telecom providers, this is a big deal, of course. And then that's just for them transporting these DDoS attacks, and um, then of course they can be the victim of DDoS attacks as well. The services that they provide um, may very well be under attack as well. So that's another uh, side of the concern. Yeah, yeah, and uh, yeah, and obviously any more uh, junk traffic than they're used to already covering, uh, carrying, that's always an, an additional one there. But uh, right. uh, yeah, I guess, I mean, has there been like a lot of these uh, attacks that you guys have seen on the networks uh, recently? Has that been a growing concern you've seen out there in, in the market? The attacks are keep growing ever uh, greater and greater in different directions uh, for many motivations. I think last year was really, um, the theme was more uh, cyber criminal cyber criminals running these for extortion purposes but of course um, uh, a little bit further back the most of the motivations have been ideological kind of attacks you know uh, from on various groups out there there you go yeah exactly so um, yeah for a lot of different reasons people launch these attacks but it's becoming within reach of anyone you can go online and just buy uh, some time from a botnet and launch an attack for anyone you want to. You can pay anonymously. And um, so disgruntled employees or anyone who feels mistreated in some way by someone, you know, for a little amount, it's very easy to launch a DDoS attack. So the problem really is becoming that everybody's at risk because just launching the attack is getting so easy to do. Mm -hmm. And again, with all these new, new devices out there connecting to the networks, there's just so many more opportunities to do this as well. And at least in the mobile space too, I mean, there's a lot of these new, uh, more open operating systems that are coming out on devices and uh, not a lot of control sometimes over what's happening on those. So it seems like, yeah, this is a, a pretty, uh, pretty ripe area for this type of, uh, these types of attacks. Yeah, I agree. That's a big concern. Uh, a lot of more connected devices and then um, that can be compromised and be enlisted um, in, in, in these botnets, right? And then... Yeah. Uh, the bigger topic, of course, with the Internet of Things, uh, even more connected devices with questionable security uh, practices as well, um, is, is growing that even further. Um, yeah. Yeah. So now, now I guess now the move towards virtualization, what sort mm. of effect is this having on, the, on these efforts? Because, I mean, uh, I, I, you know, I, I would think at some point that, you know, as operators are able to perhaps virtualize some of their functions, uh, yeah. they might be able to maybe control them a little bit more because, you know, they're almost not necessarily siloed, but they have a... Uh, they're not, you know, some hard piece of hardware sitting in the bigger picture of things. They're kind of maybe more controlled, but I, I, maybe that's not quite the right, right way to look at this. I mean, what's what's this move towards virtualization having on uh, on the security aspects of, of of telecom networks? Well, that's an interesting one. I think the, it's twofold. Uh, in one way, in an SDN environment or network fun functions virtualizations, I think operators have 
um, it's easier in one way to get more telemetry data from what's going on in the network because this is one of the fundamentals of these SDN deployments. Um, what's going on where and where's the traffic going to. So it's easier to get intelligence on what's going on and then take action on it. So that's on the plus side of it. Um, it it's making things a lot more flexible to deploy. Uh, operators can automatically scale up and scale down services, so, um, which makes it more cost effective and efficient. Mm -hmm. um, DDoS side, we'll have to see how that goes. I, th there's not a lot of data available that I know of. Um, what is interesting, though, is with DDoS, everything is about scale. Um, just last month, I, um, it was reported that the largest DDoS attack uh, topped on to 500 gigabits per second. You know, and that's, of course, those are the tip of the iceberg. Yeah. But uh, more than 10 gig uh, of DDoS attacks are definitely not uncommon. And um, handling this in an SDN environment, it's it's a little bit more fragile I think to and and you're more looking at solutions that are really also built for scale to mitigate these uh, attacks right so I think in SDN environments it will be a hybrid kind of approach to um, to tackle this problem so on the plus side you get the, the ease of getting your intelligence and telemetry data and then the actual mitigation piece I think will um, increase mostly be on hardware powered devices that can accelerate and mitigate the impact and it's especially for these large attacks the volumetric attack as they're called and you know that come up with these impressive numbers like i just mentioned um, on the higher end of the spectrum you get application layer attacks and there i definitely see um, a nice fit for um, ddos protection in an sdn environment because sdn environments is more uh, the flexible infrastructure but the applications and services that um, are riding on top of this right they, they are still potentially vulnerable will be exploited by uh, many many queries at the same time basically anything that can be exploited on the application layer by a multitude of queries uh, for example so these kind of attacks are um, perfect to be uh, mitigated also by a virtualized function of uh, DDoS protection. I, I definitely see that be, um, becoming more and more important as well. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. Does it seem like that the, that are the telecom operators out there, I mean, obviously they're aware of this. I mean, I, I go to a lot of shows and talk to a lot of operators and you know, yeah. they always talk about security and how important security is. And especially as you mentioned earlier, as we move towards this IoT environment where the, all these devices are being connected, mm -hmm. uh, you know, security is, is at least talked about. I mean, again, I, I guess the question is how, how are they following through with this talk, I mean, are you seeing a lot of operators coming to you guys? Are seeing a lot of movement on the market where these operators are indeed trying to uh, in integrate or incorporate, uh, you know, DDoS, DDoS protection or whatever, some sort of security protection into their deployment plans, or is it still kind of so early in the process that they haven't quite moved to insert that in there, and they're still trying to figure out what their what their plans are at this point? I think. They are very aware. Uh, they felt the pain already, and then that's usually the best trigger, right? You need yeah. to feel pain and then take action. Uh, DDoS is not new anymore. Sure. Of course, it's been around for, for decades by now, unfortunately, but um, especially telco oper telecom operators, they know the pain. They uh, are definitely aware that they have to take precautions into it. Um, how to integrate it into an SDN virtualized environment, that's, of course, well, a little bit new just like the whole SDN deployment is and these large operators are probably the best use case to benefit from this kind of virtualized environment and and reap the benefits of it and also will be probably the first ones to deploy um, virtualized kind of DDoS protection uh, layers in there. Yeah. yeah, and it seems like too, I mean, I know a lot of operators are looking to, you know, towards virtualization, one of the big uh, benefits is kind of the automation aspect of it. And it seems like with security, I mean, if you can have a security layer that is automated, that once it senses, you know, a spike in traffic for some reason from a certain address, if it can automatically, uh, you know, do to implement or somehow, uh, you know, get it, get, in, get in the way of that traffic or, or route that traffic somewhere else, it seems right. like that'd be a great benefit. And in a way, virtualization can really be used to an advantage. Uh, for operators in terms of, you know, if they have the right DDoS protection uh, embedded in their system, uh, that, automa uh, that automation aspect of it seems like a pretty, pretty good way to go with that. 
No, I agree. That's, that's, a, that's a really good point, actually. Um, and it ties back to what I was saying, I think, earlier, that it's easier for these operators to get telemetry data and yeah. to get statistics so they can uh, see what, what is the normal traffic and what are anomalies, and then they can automatically take action. And in an SDN environment, this is, of course, perfect to redirect traffic. Uh, so basically take it on a reactive basis and, uh, and start filtering out traffic when it's deemed necessary and, and not put something in the way of the traffic when you don't. So this kind of reactive model will work uh, extremely well in, in an SDN environment. I agree. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, but I guess is a is a is a proactive model though perhaps a better way to go. I mean, obviously, if, if they're implementing uh, software in there that is a security software, uh, I guess that's probably the proactive part of it. Uh, and then just have the software at some point be reactive to whatever happens on the network. Is that kind of the model for this? That is typically okay. the um, a model that's very very popular. Um, also because. I think that is for budgeting purposes because you do not want to have a one-on-one -on -one kind of like anything, right? Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, I don't think uh, everybody wants to deploy a one-on-one -on -one kind of protection capacity with their uplink capacity uh, necessarily, so only redirect that uh, when necessary. Uh, so it's really a scale or a money problem. <laughs> like, um, like, like most things are, uh, yeah. So doing this proactively comes with a lot of benefits as well. Uh, course because you can if you process the traffic all the time then this DDoS protection unit can learn all the baselining of the services and can easily spot when anomalies occur and uh, because he sees 100% of the data you're not reliant on samples etc right so that might may slow down the detection process mm -hmm. and um, so there are a lot of benefits and I think, especially in an SDN, it might be more compelling to do this uh, proactively as well because the benefits are so great and the scalability is a little bit less of a concern, I think, um, when you look at application kind of attacks, application layer attacks. Yeah, I was going to ask you about the scalability aspect of this because obviously, I mean, I'm sure, you know, you guys have a solution. I'm sure it's a, a robust solution out there. But I guess mm -hmm. as you look towards the move towards virtualization, is, is that scalability part of it? How, how important is that? Uh, for operators, because again, I, know, I mean, these, these rollouts of NFV and SDN and virtualization on the networks, it's starting out fairly small in certain segments, uh, but I'm guessing at some point, you know, they want to broaden that more and more, and obviously you want to be able to have uh, everything that supports that to, to scale as well. Uh, is, this, is the technology there from your guys or from vendors, uh, mm. uh, is it able to scale to the, to the level and to the needs of, of the telecom, uh, telecom environment? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, scale is uh, one of the biggest problems in DDoS, of course, and um, they, they, do have, they do have to think about deploying this um, intelligently and, and scale um, appropriately for the solution uh, because it's more than just a bandwidth, right? It's the, the packets per second, but when you, that's really on the network, on the lower end of the, of the network stack. When you look um, up in the network stack on the application layer, then still you have these scalability problems. How many sessions can you uh, support and how many objects can you monitor at the same time and how many queries per second um, are normal and which ones are anomalous. So you need to have the capacity to um, detect that and to enforce kind of your policy for, um, for excesses of these kind of uh, network flows that may, may suddenly surge. Makes sense. Makes sense. I guess for a company like yourself, what, mm. what, what did you guys have to do differently, perhaps, to support this move towards virtualization? I mean, you guys have been obviously in this, you know, in the, in the security space for oh, more than ten years now. It sounds like, uh, you know, as, as this move towards virtualization has kind of happened here, at least in the telecom space, maybe more recently, mm. have there been any adjustments you guys have had to make? I mean, have you had to, you know, do any any specific, uh, uh, you know, new, new software or anything to, to kind of adjust this, or what have you guys had to do specifically to to kind of adjust this new world out there? Sure. So. Um, one of our big differentiators, I think, is our ability to scale, uh, which is something you really need in the DDoS environment, and we do that very efficiently. Uh, we can offload a lot of the more lower-end um, attacks, uh, the network-based attacks, into specialized hardware, into FPGAs. So with 0% with CPU involvement, we can take care of a large piece of the DDoS attacks. And the thing is, when you look at the... DDoS attack spectrum. Uh, this has been changing into more multi-vector 
type attack. So attackers will adapt their attack strategies or they launch all different attack vectors simultaneously. So this really stresses out a DDoS protection solution. And from a attacker's perspective, it makes total sense, of course, because they just launch different attack vectors at the same time and they only have to break the weakest link, right? Yeah. To make their attack successful. And um, with the ability to offload a lot of the simple, more simple stuff, but still at very aggressive packet rates into specialized hardware, that makes us very robust in the face of these uh, multi-vector attacks. But on top of that, uh, it's also your ability to be able to enforce policies, to, to know what the service is doing, what the application is doing, what are normal um, application rates, what are normal, normal query rates, and then uh, enforce those limits, right? Uh, so if suddenly surges occur, that you can filter them out. So. Uh, yeah, a lot of scale issues. How many endpoints can you monitor? How many sessions can you support? That's um, something we I think we do extremely well. Interesting, interesting. And obviously, the, the provisioning aspect of this is a big part too. I, mean, I know for operators, for instance, uh, as they move towards virtualization, uh, one of their key markets they're going after is the enterprise market. And obviously, enterprises, uh, you know, security to them is is yeah. always top of mind. Uh, yeah. so I'm guessing that the provisioning aspect of this. I mean, obviously, some enterprises might want a certain level of, of security and others might not need as much and operators can kind of work with them for that. It sounds like you guys are able to kind of work with the operators, uh, at least provide a pretty robust and, uh, and scalable and, and uh, something they can actually kind of mod modify themselves really uh, to sort yeah. of what, what, their, what their customers need then. Indeed. Well, you bring up a good point that I didn't touch on yet is uh, uh, our ability to integrate as well. Uh, we have an API that is 100% parity. We rebuilt our operating system to run completely on API calls. So that means our API is 100% on par with what you can do on the CLI, you can do through the API, making it extremely um, attractive in, in an SDN kind of deployment scenario. And we can integrate with any kind of third party solution and, and build a bigger, better solution um, in that way. And then more on support, I guess, is, um, a full parity in IPv4 and IPv6 support. Uh, a lot of traditional solutions have, are focusing on IPv4. V V6 is a little bit more of an afterthought, but you do create a, a potential security hole in there if your defenses are all focused on IPv4 and then you miss pieces in your IPv6 implementation, you just created a hole in your, in your defenses, basically. So this is something that we also had in mind when we built our product to make it completely on uh, complete parity on V4 and V6, because that, of course, is um, the next generation IP protocol. And in more connected uh, environments, um, such as SDN, where you have all these connections, uh, IPv6, um, I think, will will grow very rapidly. Yeah, it seems like, yeah, right. I mean, the, the whole virtualized environment and, and again, mm -hmm. all these new devices connecting. So, yeah, it seems like V6 is kind of, but, but it's what should be expected. Yeah, and then think of an, op an enterprise not mm -hmm. wanting to, to to tackle that or security not wanting to tackle that. It seems yeah. uh, very short-sighted. I mean, like very, extremely short-sighted, I would think. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Got to tackle that part of it. So, interesting, interesting. Well, I guess as we kind of look forward a bit, I mean, you know, again, like we were saying earlier, I mean, you know, these attacks aren't, uh, aren't decreasing. Uh, we're seeing more and more of these out there. It seems like they're almost becoming easier uh, to do for some, for some reason. I mean, just, again, more devices coming out there makes it easier. Um, yeah. And as you look at maybe some of the challenges for the telecom space going forward, I mean, what do you guys see as maybe some big hurdles that they need to kind of uh, be aware of and perhaps need to tackle uh, in the near term to kind of make sure that, you know, that they are moving forward with this virtualization uh, platforms, but doing it in a, in a secure environment so they can, you know, again, make sure that, you know, all these new services and, and new customers uh, are, are getting on these networks and not having to worry about uh, this increased uh, attack, uh, attack risk. Yeah, I think these operators really need to look at uh, their deployment, make sure that you are able to get all your telemetry data, know what's going on in your network, so you're quick, uh, quick on being able to detect what is normal and what are anomalies, and that you can take action on that uh, dynamically as well, because yeah, there's a lot of adaptive attacks happening uh, at the same time. You, you need an intelligent kind of detection network that is able to 
know what's normal and uh, take action when things seem to go wrong. And of course, the, um, the danger there is that you take care of false positives. So um, it will be wise to take your actions in a, in a more progressive kind of manner. Um, so escalate it progressively and, and not immediately drop all traffic, but uh, you, you can maybe start with doing some kind of validations on the client and, uh, and make sure, and, and I'm sure there's a more smart ways that we will see in the future, um, how they can sort of have this dynamic kind of feedback loop on knowing, you know, that the, uh, uh, that the countermeasures are effective and, and not harmful and, um, and learn from those attacks throughout your deployment. So don't overreact, but uh, react in a, in a responsible manner. But again, you know, these are, these yeah. are, these are reactions that have to be done in, uh, in split seconds. So you have to have obviously a very uh, smart and robust uh, system behind there to kind of take care of this. But, uh, but again, you can't overreact because you don't want to throttle everybody's traffic and all of a sudden the whole network crashes uh, because of that. But uh, again, you can yeah. segregate uh, that, that, that traffic uh, appropriately. Uh, Absolutely. Cool. Yeah. And then, uh, and then of course, you know, be able to scale, make sure you provision the network, uh, be expect the unexpected and uh, make sure you can scale for that as well. Uh, leave enough headroom. Uh, one of the interesting things of course of SDN is to be able to scale up and scale down automatically. Um, and, and that goes for your protection solutions, your security solutions as well. Make sure that they can scale all the way up and in, in the worst case scenario and, uh, and, and look far ahead in terms of uh, provisioning your network. Makes sense. Makes sense. And obviously I'm guessing, you know, your, your guys' solution there is, is, is capable of doing all those things. I'm hoping at this point too. I mean, I'm sure you guys are ready to scale with what, <laughs> with what your customers need. I'm guessing at this point. Too. I'm glad to say that it is. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. good to hear. I'm glad to hear that part. So well, hey, right. Renee, like, Renee, again, this is a topic that, uh, again, I haven't touched on a lot on the show here and I know uh, it's a growing part. Cause like I said earlier, I mean, I know a lot of the operators I talk to and at different shows we go to, I mean, we always hear security as being a big part of this and it's definitely a, a subject I think we need to tackle a little bit more because again, I think as you're saying, you know, with all these new devices connecting to the network uh, from random areas and all these things, you know, are just bought at the store and thrown on the network there. Uh, that security issue is going to be a, a growing concern for a lot of these operators. So being, being able to stay on top of that's a, a really important part of it. So, um, yeah, definitely appreciate the great insight on that topic. And, and again, as this kind of progresses, hopefully again, we can touch base uh, again soon and kind of get some updates from you guys. But uh, thank you forward to it. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for the time and effort. On that. To do. And uh, so thank you, Dan. This was a very interesting talk. Yes, very good. Well, again, appreciate the time today, Renee, and uh, we'll talk again soon, hopefully. Well, great insight there from May 10 on that topic. Well, thanks for joining us on this week's show, and make sure to check us out again next week for a new episode. NFV SDN Reality Check with Dan Meyer is a production of RCR TV. To suggest show topics or to reach Dan, you can find him on email, dmeyer at rcrwireless.com, and on Twitter at Meyer underscore Dan. For more Dan, news on NFVSDN and everything wireless, find your way over to rcrwireless.com.